Hello and welcome once again to Baked Beans Garage where it's time to make the spaghetti. So we've made a lot of progress on the old rig in the past few months, but uh, nothing really works yet because all our nerves are outside yet. So today we're going to put them back in. There's a lot of nastiness in here. So let's get into it. So if you've been watching the series, you know we have an engine, we got stoppers, we got some fuel, we got suspension brakes, all that good stuff, brakes and stoppers. Uh, but we got no wires yet, so nothing works. And I need some things to plug into other things, what for making this go over them. So here's what we're working with today. Starting over here, got a fresh new electron cube. We got the three engine bay harnesses, which are quite nasty and need completely gone through. Got some nice new fabric harness tape. That'll be nice. Some surprise implements that will help us later. Diagrams. Uh, the original glow plug relay, which doesn't work. Uh, here I got some starter solenoids. That one's for a lawnmower. That one's for a razor or motorbike or something. I don't know. That's going to run the glow plug. It's just going to be manual. Cut all that nonsense out and just have a switch. Uh, not sure if I'm going to use this yet. This is a distribution block from an A4 Volkswagen. So Mark IV, Golf, Jetta, what have you. These are very nice for running aftermarket accessories and whatnot because you have a big old heavy gauge feed into here. Then you have these real heavy duty fusible links to run some high current stuff. Then you have three smaller circuits with regular fuses over here that you can run some smaller loads. But the original Volvo setup is actually pretty slick. So I don't know if I'm gonna use that. I'm gonna use that over there, but maybe not here. So I mentioned diagrams, a word on reference material when you're doing electrical works. You always wanna have that. Unfortunately, with a 740, I'm stuck with the old Haynes manual. While it is usable, it does not hold a candle to the Bentley manuals. Just look at the girth on that fella. Uh, we'll get to an E36 at some point. These just have delightful wiring diagrams that I love so much. This is kind of a mess and hard to use, but uh, if and when I need to troubleshoot, we'll get into that. Troubleshooting aside, just using the peepers, I can see some things that need fixing, like uh, the old uh, glow plug relay uh, plug. Uh, those bare wires aren't so good. That's probably why the fuse melted out of the fuse box. That's pretty good. Uh, some of this junk here. Uh, lots of corrosion, lots of broken insulation, missing terminals, all that. So, just visually, I'm going to redo this. First is going to be getting this uh, conduit off of there. So to begin, I have this little headlight sub harness, which goes to one of the sides. And this is pretty apparently not correct. Uh, at least we can see the colors and what goes where. So that's going to be easy enough to fix. Now, I know I'm going to want to keep the headlights as well as this marker light over here. That's pretty gross. There is some stuff I'm going to get rid of, which we'll have to look through the diagrams later to figure out what's what. But anyways, that's going to need fixed. So the special tools, this is a seam ripper, what you'd use for sewing when you make a boo-boo. You got to undo your stitches. I don't know how to sew, but these are quite handy for getting through, uh, you know, electrical tape conduit like this. And it has the little ball on the one end what for protecting the wires so you're not slicing them up. And you just run that down and peel it away quite nice and easy. Another thing you can use that takes a little extra care is one of these hook blades, what for opening cardboard boxes, but that's a little less safe than the old $2 seam ripper. So for this here, I'm quite a fan of these rectangular connectors Volvo uses because you don't need a special uh, pinning or extractor tool. These little uh, silicone or rubber grommets that hold the pins are just friction fit into the connector and you can just pull them out and have access to your contact, which is quite nice. I just ripped Oh, those were already broken. That's fine. Now here I can see there's actually no strands broken. This is probably just a result of either ozone, UV, some kind of damage just ate away at this insulation on the exposed part because everything else is still in nice shape. That insulation is still nice and flexible. So this guy I'll just be able to fix with some heat shrink, but obviously these two fellas are going to need spliced. And we can see here that these... Uh, exposed wires are quite gross and oxidized and dirty, and those aren't going to take solder when you put heat to them. 
So to clean them up, you just want to take some sandpaper or real coarse scotch bright to get that back down to bare copper, and then that'll let you uh, be able to tin them so you can solder. And for fixing the insulation, you know, you, you want to put the heat shrink on first. There's two types of people. There are people who have forgotten to put the heat shrink on first, and there are liars. And now one consideration to make is you want to slide this as far back as you can because you don't want the heat from your solder to start shrinking that before you want it shrunk. And then you're in all kinds of a pickle. There's just enough there for matching up the colors. And for soldering, for the uninitiated, you want to keep a damp sponge around for knocking off uh, any, you know, burnt... Uh, flux or other kind of goop that accumulates on there that just thermally shocks it makes it shrink and it falls right off and what I'm using is 32 thousandths rosin core I wouldn't personally bother with anything other than it uh, especially don't use unleaded solder you know just don't take too deep of a breath when you're working with regular leaded solder And remember, you're not trying just to melt the solder wire. You're trying to heat what you're soldering, you know, the copper wire, enough for it to be able to melt the, uh, the solder, or else you're not going to get any good wicking action, and you're going to have a cold solder joint, which is no good. And this is the way I've always done it. Just butt them together with a little overlap, and then give them a twist and then solder that just makes for a nicer, uh, a slimmer joint than trying to tin them separately and then put them together. Now you need to let that cool down before you slide your heat shrink back up for obvious reasons, but uh, just to make the length consistent. I am going to go ahead and cut this guy. And to finish that up, you just want to take some brake cleaner acetone to clean up all the remaining flux that'll also pull it down so you know you're safe before you slide your heat shrink on. Speaking of heat shrink, this is specific marine heat shrink which has a little like sealant layer on the inside so that when you get it hot that'll melt and seal it real nice and tight around your insulation and whatever else it's around. What for keeping the moistures out and preventing that from happening in the future. And of course, for shrinking that, the old BIC 3000 is always an option, but if you're gonna be doing a bunch of them, just spend the money and get a heat gun. It'll, it'll make it easier in the long run. Now, once we get the rest of the harness cleaned up and laid in where we want it, we can come back with the, uh, the felt tape. Uh, this is nice and it beats by a long shot, regular you know vinyl electrical tape, because this will let water in and out with the vinyl stuff, it can't breathe and it can't flex as well. We'll talk about that in a little while, but we'll give that a wrap later. So that's one connector down, only about 17,000 more to go. So uh, I guess montage. And while I was doing this, I found a few issues that need to be corrected. These little nylon inserts, what hold the pins into the connector, two little tangs, and you can pry that door open, and you can see those inserts would have turned into crumbly. Clean that out a bit, and mark which wire goes where, of course. These are for the uh, windshield washer pumps. 
It's a wagon, so we got two of them. The sedans, you'll just have one. I'm just going to stack up a couple layers of heat shrink to hold the pin centered in that plug. Here using the BIC 3000, what for convenience. And then the last two aren't going to go quite all the way. See, on the back of the plastic bit, you have these two teeth. What hold, well, what held the nylon insert in. And these pins don't go all the way to the front of the plug. They sit back in there probably about five millimeters. So you want to set this one so it is just about like that. And the back end of this heat shrink will be retained by these two uh, little tangs there. And it should look something like that. And once I click that down, that'll hold it well enough. And to hold those in there, I'm gonna use one of my favorite elixirs, the Shugu. We'll just give it a slather. And to make sure the pins are gonna set up where they need to be when that cures, just plug it into the thing it plugs into. And that'll hold them well enough till that dries. Now I got a few more to do like that and then we'll start putting wires back in the car. And with all the obvious problems cleaned up a little bit, uh, ready to lay them back in the car, just gonna feed them through the feed throughs and drape them around roughly where they need to go. There's only three feed throughs, one there, one there, and one there. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention, when you're taking that conduit off, put a zip tie anywhere there's a branch that way you know where those are but for making put it back in more prettier yeah we'll go with that anyway it's not going to film this part because it's going to be tedious i'm being in and out and with those all cleaned up you know, for the most part they look good enough uh you start laying them in you know replace all your zip ties what at each branch with a piece of tape just makes it easier to wrap up later a few zip ties on some temporary stuff yet but we can go over some of the anatomy of this uh, first harness you're going to put in or remove, I don't know, is this big guy with the big connector down under the dash that comes along the, uh, pilot side strut power that gives you front to back horns are down there. We'll get to that. Uh, these headlights, the, uh, turn indicator, the parking light, all that also comes and plugs into the second harness you want to worry about, which goes down and makes the engine think and then talks to the cluster and all that. Uh, <clears throat> third one comes out from this feed through down behind the boost or right behind the injection pump. I don't know what a red block looks like in here. That goes over the other side and that runs your overheat fan and a few other things. We'll talk about that. The fourth, I can't count. Other big connector under the dash here uses that feed through and that comes up and gives you your lights on this corner. Uh, interesting note. Right here, what mounts right to the front of the coolant jug on a gasser, that would be what's called the uh, radio suppression relay, something like that. So in a gasser, obviously Bosch fuel injection, not this, if it had a red block. Uh, when those injectors are firing, going on and off and on and off, they generate noise, a little bit of AC, and they move that relay out to here what, so your head unit isn't picking up that interference and interfering with the radio, which is pretty nifty. On a diesel, however, this is the overheat fan relay. There is a switch on the radiator right about there, floating in the air. And then, I don't know, over there somewhere there's a fan. What sits in the front of the AC condenser, in case she gets real hot, that'll click on and blow through a little bit. Might have to rework that, what with the intercooler going there. Some new battery cables, just generic ones from Rock Auto. Yeah, you're gonna wanna measure them before you buy some. What, cause this uh, red one goes down all the way across the cross member over to the starter, as does the main engine harness. Comes and loops down around there. More aviation goodies. I'm a big fan of these little nylon standoffs. What for keeping your wires from rubbing on everything. And also in that harness, what goes under the injection pump is the oil pressure sender can't see it but it's on the back of the head there other ones up oh no those are temperature i don't know what i'm talking about oil pressure's down there i think i only put it in there don't ask me questions moving along to the inside of the rig 
went and put the fuse box mount back in from last time, just some screws and it clips down in there. All of the vacuum lines, what are coming from the HVAC control panel, those are all plugged back in. You want to write what color each hose is when you take them off what, so you get them back in the right spot. And speaking of that harness, what goes down near the injection pump, that also gives you the feed line for the vacuum pump, what for moving all those vacuum motors around. And there's a gray one. I don't know what that does yet, but we'll figure it out. And with all this loosely laid in before I go making it pretty, I'm gonna actually try to get everything working first in case I have to do repairs or add or subtract wires. Uh, I'm gonna start with the glow plug relay. I was gonna use a little universal solenoid, but looking at this guy, that's just a big old relay there, which seems to still work. It's just uh, what talks to it, what's fried. So I think I'm gonna lobotomize this and just make it a switch so I can use all the original wiring and hardware and keep it looking factory. One thing I also noticed, which is this broke wire here, this is a little, uh, I guess, ambient pressure switch. You have your altitude compensator solenoid on the injection pump right there. I'm not really sure what it does, but it is in the place where it would be manipulating timing. And also there's a tube going into it. So I'm guessing it changes some kind of timing or fuel issues, what for high altitudes. But when I plugged in the fuel shutoff solenoid, I realized that that is this wire that goes to here but logic would dictate it would go to there. And the Haynes manual is useless because it's a Haynes manual and I can't find anything for the diesels. So again, we'll figure it out if it's an issue. So this little nugget's just one big relay. You're probably used to seeing them like this, but it's all the same innards, just a little bigger. Uh, I can hear you see a little uh, heat discoloration What from it only using one of the contacts. So I poked and prodded at them. So they both seem to, you know, click down at, just about the right time and I also polished them with some 500 grit. So to get this thing to stop thinking on its own all I got to do is get rid of this here board and then take two control wires. So I'll use these original contacts and connector. Two will be to run it. We'll have one for the uh, for the indicator on the dash and then maybe just one dead pin. I don't know. Anyways this is held on by these solder tabs what hold it to the thingy and for figuring out the plusative and the minusative of the control circuit got my jump pack Ooh, this will be difficult Ooh. first try I guessed right so that's the negative that's the positive all right, so here is what I came up with in the end. Uh, the control circuit just soldered to these two contacts, did some chew goo on there what, for keeping the vibrations out of that teeny tiny little single strand wire. Also took from the output side of the relay and hooked it into this terminal here, what for the light on the dash for the glow plugs, so you know when they're lit up. Uh, with that, it's taken it from the actual relay. So if for some reason, the relay isn't closing, there's an issue with the control circuit. Even if you have the switch on, that's only gonna light up the dash light if the glow plugs are actually getting warm. Uh, also, another reason I wanted to use the original guy is because you have this fusible link built right into it, so I won't have to have an external fuse. And I went and cut a similar plug out of the parts car. I had the option between uh, completely crumbly uh, terminal holder inner guys and nice wires or very bad wires and intact them thingies. So I went with this option, I'm gonna solder her in. Here's what that circuit looks like. Uh, this might be a lot, but uh, just Google what these symbols mean. So here's the relay itself. There's the control coil. What, when you put electricity through it, it's just an electromagnet which slams down on this relay to close it. Uh, there's the fusible link uh, coming over here to the battery. Uh, fed from the hot side as is the switch in the dash and that just controls this uh, Control circuit then here's the output of the relay to the glow plugs and then grounded down to the head and Here we take off from the output side of the relay over to the dash light now last time I did this in my rabbit I found that the dash light actually used a switched ground and not a switched positive so in the event of that we come down here 
and everyone knows if you place a solid block and then a redstone torch on the other side, when you feed it from the back, it just inverts the signal. So a switched power will turn into a switched ground to use for this guy. Uh, now over here, in the event that I want to use a transistor, just Google how those things work. It's pretty nifty. Uh, when I have a positive here, it'll do the electron magic in here and make that a ground through the light. And there's the imaginary feed to said light. We'll get there when we get there. In the meantime, I'm just gonna start throwing wires at this plug and throw it back in the car. Okay, so I made some changes, mainly because I found a little relay before I found a transistor in the old parts bin. But I think that's a horn relay from a Mark II Jetta, if I'm not mistaken, but it fits here in the glow plug relay box quite nicely. Uh, here's what that circus looks like. Uh, the light in the cluster did end up being a switched ground. I could tell from just laying my peepers onto the flex circuit in the back of the cluster. So that's where that guy is. There's the switch on the dash. Here's the actual uh, relay for the glow plugs. And then up here, here's that other little relay. You can see when we uh, power that control coil, we also power this one and that shoves the electrons from the light through onto ground, which is run down to the, goodbye, to the grounding block in the front apron right there. Quite convenient. So for the wire to the indicator light right here, I just used the existing wire, which is this lovely salmon pink color. It's in there somewhere. For the control wire from the switch, I just hijacked the courtesy under hood light wire because that already runs in and it has a junction at those two big connectors down here. That's convenient. Uh, and everyone has a flashlight in their phone, which is 10 times brighter than the old ding -a -ling there. And then for the ground, that's just a new wire down into there. So over here, I've tidied up the uh, battery cable. Also ran the starter solenoid wire. Of course, if you watch the engine video, we switched from the newer Delphi geared starter to the older Bosch direct drive starter. Uh, so we have a ring terminal instead of a spade connector. So I just had to long in that a little bit. For the charging lead, I just used some mil spec, more airplane stuff, eight gauge and some random uh, ring terminals I had laying around. And for that, I used an old pair of diagonal cutters, what I lopped the cutting edges off. These are good for putting beads around intercooler pipes. I'm sure we'll see these again later. Here on the back of the alternator, we have the W terminal and the uh, the other one. Yeah, yeah. That's for your field excitation. This guy's for the tack here. Uh, what, because it's a diesel, we don't have any sparkulators, what, for sending a signal to the tack. So it pretty much just uses a noise signal off of the uh, diode block inside there. What for knowing the Ripums? Uh, there's that blue and green guy. That's the starter wire. Uh, this yellow and black, I don't know yet. We'll see if that stays or goes away. Here, the, the blue and the brown, this is for the battery overheat sensor, which is at the battery. This is an earlier style alternator, so we don't have that. That just tells your uh, indicator light on the dash to come on when the battery's melting. And of course, the other end of that is over here, which can go away because it's not going to do anything anymore. Speaking of not doing anything, the EGR relay uh, for the exhaust gas recirculation, that's emissions nonsense, which we don't need. Of course, know the laws where you live uh, might get you in trouble. It might not. Here, I don't need it because diesels don't get emissions inspections, which is convenient. So we'll tidy that up a little bit, uh, get rid of that. Also, this... Uh, vacuum switch and the little uh, idle switch back here. These wires, pretty much all these can go away because that is all part of the EGR system, which isn't going to exist anymore. Also, down on the back of the head, there's another uh, temp sensor, which is a brown wire that goes down underneath the injection pump. That can also go away because that only ever talked to the glow plug relay. What for a warm start so we can get rid of that too. All right, so I only had that slightly wrong. The red wire is actually for the uh, battery light on the dash and the white and red, the W terminal is for the tack. It's, uh, I guess you'd call a one wire alternator because it's internally regulated. So uh, now with the key on, 
I should be able to spin that up with the drill and make sure it's charging. Should also see some indication on the pack. And you may or may not hear it, but I'll feel it. You'll hear it free spin for a while, and then once it excites, it'll start to load up. There it is. We see the meter jump, jump up to around 13 and change. Might not quite be spinning it fast enough to get all 14 volts out of it, but that's good. So with that working, I went and tidied that up a bit with some split conduit. The yellow and black connector is for the overboost switch or the dump valve at the front of the manifold. That's gonna be gone. We're gonna have a regular gauge, so I got rid of those, also the EGR connections, and I capped and stowed them, just uh, cut the wire and left it in there with a bit of heat shrink crimped on the end to keep it insulated. That way, if later I wanna run oil pressure, oil temp, or a boost gauge that needs some wires on this half of the engine, I can just tap into those instead of having to run a whole new wire, which is quite convenient. Speaking of that, I'll go ahead and get rid of all the EGR nonsense from the injection pump and these wires will stow them or cap and stow them somewhere around there for the same reasons. So I've been a bit of a silly goose. I ended up uh, capping some of the wires that went to the EGR relay, which wasn't necessary. So I'll go ahead and hop in the pond. Uh, the only wiring left to clean up is these two little gray guys here. And I have peeled through the whole uh, manual time and time again. The only thing I can find that has two gray wires going to it is an oil level, level sensor. And that's for the B28F, which is the V6, not the uh, six in a row here. And as far as I can tell, nothing's ever even been plugged into these two guys. And there's a plug in the oil pan down there. I'm guessing where that would have been. I might be wrong, but I don't think I need them so they can go away. And those go to this little three pin connector. And the only other wire in it went to the EGR nonsense. So that can go away altogether. And we'll be about done up in here. Once I go ahead and clean up all the little uh, spade terminals, I got some new ones here uh, just to keep it locked on there a little nicer. Same as the shut off solenoid and the altitude compensator. So that's all looking quite handsome now that it's tidied up and dressed out and all that so we can move along to some safety items like maybe lights and a honk honk and all that but first I suppose we can test some things. Here is the sender for the temperature gauge in the cluster. I have some wire here grounding it out because all that gauge is measuring is the resistance between it and ground. And then I have some off the shelf hella horns to put on. So let's give her a test. Here I have the panel. This is the power antenna switch out of the parts car. And as soon as I turn the key, we should see full hot. Full hot, very good. And then give that a click. We hear it clunking out there, just perfect. And of course, I'll address that uh, routing and security once I know they work. Love, ooh. Eh, sounds about German. Another thing I noticed that kind of auto-corrected was the windows. They used to be very slow, but now uh, three out of four are working pretty well. The regulator in this one's all blowed apart, so we'll address that later. Another thing is the wipers are also working as intended. I just didn't know uh, what I was doing. Also got the old squirter bottle put back in. We can hear that pump running, that one. Hold it for a minute. There go the front wipers. Lovely. Make sure that's still working. Nice. Now, of course, that's not a wait to start light anymore. That's just, hey, they're on. Turn them off before you burn them up. And I do believe I forgot to mention that I actually went online and after some digging, I found the original green book, well, gray book now, but if you know your Volvos, you know what the green books are and how valuable they are. But I also noticed at the back of the green book, 
the diagrams that it gives you look quite familiar. So yeah, I guess that's where Haynes got them. That's why I like the Bentley manuals, because they actually make their own and they make sense to look at. Uh, these, without these, you know, how it works pictures, uh, these diagrams don't get you very far. So this has been a great help putting this thing back together. So since this is a North American model, the outer headlights are high-low beams and the inners are just high beams, but I have uh, high-low beams in all four because I want high-low beams in all four because if you've ever driven with sealed beam headlights, you know that they suck. But uh, I am absolutely not putting aftermarket LEDs in here. They look horrible except for the uh, those new Holly retro bright ones, but I'm not paying $800 for headlights. But a uh, little rant on headlights first. So imagine you're the car and this is a wall or the road. Your low beam pattern should look something like that, at least if you're in North America, with a little more light on the ditch side of the road and a little less light on the side, you know, where the other drivers are coming at you. Uh, in Europe and, you know, right-hand drive countries, low beams look like this where you have a lot of light over here where the ditch is, but then it cuts off so you're not blinding the other drivers. This is the difficult part. The high beams are easy because then you just throw the light wherever you want. But aftermarket companies and, you know, the cheapo, no-name China brand headlights that you can get on eBay for 30 bucks don't really care about any of this. And uh, they just make the low beams dimmer and the high beams brighter. And they both blind other drivers. So, uh, yeah, making them DOT approved is a little difficult, not to mention expensive. And when you buy cheap junk from overseas, you never know if they're built for this standard or this standard, even if they say dot rated, they probably aren't if they're $30 on eBay. And this is pretty easy for modern projector lenses and you know, companies with big R&D departments, but these old glass reflector units aren't very good at either of those. So they're just dimmer so they don't blind other people. And of course, originally in the car, you only have the two low beams. That's just because it was cheaper. So uh, four dim versions of this is probably better than two dim versions of this. So we'll, we'll try it. So based on a cursory glance at the drawings and a not so well-educated opinion, the high beams and low beams are all fed by the same switches and fuses. So the low beam circuit should be more than capable of handling two lights. If it's not, it'll let the smoke out pretty immediately and then we'll know. But anyways, here's the little headlight sub harness. Uh, here's what it originally is. So on a high low beam, obviously you have three prongs. On just a high beam, you got two. Obviously power and ground on there. On these, the middle one is your high beam and then these are the low beams. Uh, I don't know, just pause it if you really care. This is what these are right now and this is what I'm gonna make them. Let's see if light, light, and light. Lovely. Wow, everything works suddenly. Probably just finicky bulb sockets. Very typical. All right, so that's the front end all lit up. Let's try the aft end. One blonker, two blonker. All three stoppers. Oh, even reverse. Lovely. And no taillights. Cool. And to be honest, I have been procrastinating on these taillights because someone tried to hack in a trailer hitch plug at some point and used all these little blade type, I don't know, splices. If you put these in an automobile, especially in a place where they're going to get wet, you should be dragged out into the woods, beaten with a bowling trophy, and left bleeding in the moonlight, because that's about the worst thing you can do to your poor wires. Don't use those. Just a very convenient place for corrosion to live. Anyways, going to start with cutting all of this junk out, and then see if some things start working. And finally, we got some nice Christmas tree action going on back here. Even the plate lights working. It was just a matter of some crusty connections at these bulb holders. I got them to work now, but I'll clean those up a little more thoroughly when I take them out to the whole car. These rear fog lights threw me for a bit of a loop trying to get them to work. 
because they only come on when the high beams are off. So I figured that out. So I did get done just about everything that was on my list for the episode. Uh, don't get used to that. That is the exception, not the norm. That won't happen all the time. Also under here, everything's routed and dressed out quite nicely. So at least when we have a fire in the future, it probably won't be electrical in nature. Things to come. Got some audio goodies here. Little baby sub woofer. Want to be like that guy on TikTok with the Regare cars with the real loud drum and bass. Just a little fella. Also a power sunroof, 86. Only had a manual one, so that will be going in. Also some boost paraphernalia we'll get to. So that'll be all for today. If you've enjoyed this video, I do ask that you like, subscribe, leave a hateful comment, tell me all the things I did wrong. Would love to hear it. So yeah, anyway, big things coming for the brick, but for now, I am Chinchilla and this has been Baked Beans Garage. I will see you next time.